19th century saw significant advancements in medical science, with anatomy being a key area of study. However, the supply of legally obtained cadavers was insufficient to meet the demand of medical schools. This is exactly what led to the emergence of body snatching as a lucrative, though illegal trade, and it's time we took a dive into this dark underbelly of Victorian society. Starting off our list today, we have the Resurrection Men. Enter a foggy Victorian cemetery at midnight, a scene straight out of a gothic novel. This is the office space for the era's most eerie profession. Grave robbing, also known by the more genteel term resurrection men. These guys didn't just dig up daisies, they unearthed freshly buried bodies, trading in the dead for cold hard cash. Now imagine choosing grave robbing as your career path. Talk about job security in the Victorian era. These gents weren't your average shovelers, they were like the Houdinis of the graveyard, armed with a toolkit that would make any modern burglar envious. They had to be swift, silent, and smart, working under the cloak of darkness to outwit any watchful eyes. And their modus operandi? Slipping in, snagging the body, and slipping out, all without leaving a trace, except for an empty coffin. That is. But here's where it gets even spicier. Sometimes these grave robbers weren't working alone, they had inside help. Imagine teaming up with the cemetery's night watchman, who's supposed to be guarding against, well, you, but instead he's in on the gig, getting a cut of the loot and keeping mum, or even handing over the freshest grave intel. The Victorian grave robber, part detective, part thief, and full time practitioner of the macabre. They danced a fine line between the living and the dead, driven by demand, daring, and the promise of profit in a world where morality could be as murky as the graveyards they plundered. If you're like me, your next question is probably something along the lines of what were the bodies being used for? Like I mentioned previously, they would often be sold to medical institutions. These bodies were used for dissection and study by medical students and researchers who often turned a blind eye to the dubious origins of their subjects. In some cases, the bodies obtained through grave robbing were used for public dissections, attended by medical students, and sometimes even just the general public. because. What else was there to do? There was no TV or TikTok, I guess. These events were part educational and part morbid spectacle, obviously, which illustrated the blurred lines between scientific inquiry and entertainment. Humans, we've got a weird history with stuff like that. If you're a little more familiar with the world of Victorian body snatching, first of all, are you okay? And second of all, then you've probably heard of the most infamous case, the one of Burke and Hare. William Burke and William Hare were two men living in Edinburgh, Scotland, who saw an opportunity to profit from the high demand for cadavers in the medical community. Instead of exhuming bodies, they committed a series of killings, providing their victims bodies to doctors. Dr. Robert Knox, an anatomy lecturer for dissection and research. Their method was particularly sinister and became known as burking, a term that referred to their strategy of befriending their victims, often vulnerable individuals such as the elderly, intoxicated, or the impoverished, before taking their lives. The specific method they used ensured that the bodies were undamaged and more valuable to medical practitioners. Their crimes were not driven by malice, but by a cold, calculated economic incentive, which arguably made their actions even more horrifying. Once caught for their crimes, the subsequent trial and execution of Burke and then Hare's testimony in exchange for immunity were widely publicized, leading to a surge in public awareness and concern over the ethics of body procurement for medical research. This case, along with the ensuing scandal, played a very crucial role in the passage of the Anatomy Act of 1832, which leads us directly into our next point. Clearly, everything got so grim that they essentially had to pass a new law to keep people from literally stealing humans from their graves. The Anatomy Act of 1832 marked a pivotal moment in medical history and public policy in the UK, fundamentally changing the relationship between medical science and society. It stipulated that unclaimed bodies, those of people who died in hospitals, workhouses, and other public institutions, and who had no relative 
relatives able or willing to pay for their burial could be lawfully used for anatomical dissection. Additionally, the law allowed individuals to donate their own or their next of kin's bodies to science, a provision that began to destigmatize the use of human bodies for medical research. The Anatomy Act also aimed to regulate the anatomical study by requiring medical schools and practitioners to be licensed and to keep detailed records of the bodies they dissected. Up today, we of course have to talk about the protective measures. Of course, people were now afraid that they or their loved ones were going to get snatched out of the ground, which of course led to various protective measures. Families would use mort safes, which were iron cages or frameworks that surrounded a coffin, making it extremely difficult for grave robbers to access without significant time and effort, which increased their risk of being caught. In addition to mort safes, families sometimes used large, heavy stone slabs known as mort stones, which were placed over graves to prevent any tampering. Some cemeteries even erected watchtowers where guards could oversee the graveyard, especially at night when body snatchers were most likely to strike. Next on our list today, we have Ben Crouch and Co. Ben Crouch is one of those names from this era in time that is associated with fear. Ben Crouch's operations in the early 19th century demonstrate the level of organization and sophistication that could be achieved in this nefarious trade of body snatching. His gang, one of the most notorious of its time, operated like a well-oiled machine, capitalizing on the high demand for fresh cadavers by medical schools in London. Crouch's gang was not just like a ragtag group of opportunists, but a coordinated network of individuals with very specific roles and responsibilities. The organization allowed them to conduct multiple grave robbing operations simultaneously and efficiently, maximizing their profits and supplying a steady stream of bodies to medical institutions. They would often scope out cemeteries ahead of time, identifying fresh graves and planning their operations with precision. The use of silent tools and signals, their strategic placement of lookouts, and the development of quick and efficient methods for removing a body from a coffin and transporting it without arousing suspicion were hallmarks of their operation. Pained their relationship with anatomists and medical students, understanding their needs and schedules. This close relationship ensured a reliable market for their grim merchandise, and sometimes even provided inside information that could aid in their activities, such as the best time to deliver bodies or specific requests for certain types of cadavers. Despite his success in the trade, Ben Crouch eventually became an informant for the authorities, like plot twist of the century. The reasons for this shift are not entirely clear, but could include things like the threat of legal action, the promise of financial reward, or just perhaps a desire to escape the dangers and moral weight of his profession. Next on our list today, we have Jean Baptiste. Jean, whose full name was Jean Baptiste Van Lanningham, provides an American counterpart to the tales of grave robbing more commonly associated with the UK. So imagine Salt Lake City back in January 1862, mourning the loss of young Maroni Clausen. His friends and family were grieving, having just said their goodbyes at the grave site, but just when they thought they could start to heal, something utterly bizarre flips the script. Maroney wasn't just any guy, he had a bit of a wild side, recently nabbed for a daring attack on Governor John W. Dawson. But after a dramatic escape attempt left him fatally wounded, he ended up in a pauper's grave, dressed by the compassionate Officer Heath. Fast forward a week and Maroney's brother finds the grave tampered with and Maroney's body shockingly undressed. Henry Heath, detective mode on, hunting down leads, the trail heats up at the home of one Jean Baptiste, a grave digger with a very macabre side hustle. Imagine walking into a house and finding a creepy collection of burial attire and a stash of shoes that would make a cobbler blush, all pilfered from over 300 graves. That's insane. The city went bananas when they caught wind of Baptist's ghastly hobby. Pitchforks out, the community was ready to take justice into their own hands. Jail wasn't good enough for Jean, so in the end, it was said that he was exiled, but his true fate remains a mystery even to this day. Next up, we have coffin collars and torpedoes. A version of protective measures I failed to mention earlier that is far more dramatic is the use of coffin collars and grave torpedoes. 
I can't emphasize that enough. These devices, particularly used in the United States during the 19th century, illustrate the lengths to which people would go to ensure the sanctity of their loved ones' resting places. Coffin collars were essentially iron bands that were placed around the necks or bodies of the deceased within the coffin. These bands were bolted or otherwise fastened to the bottom of the coffin, making it extremely difficult for body snatchers to remove the body without a ton of effort. But the craziest thing I've ever heard of in my life are grave torpedoes, which took the concept of grave protection to a more violent level. Patented in the United States in the late 19th century, these devices were essentially just landmines for graves. They were designed to detonate if a grave was tampered with, causing injury or death to the grave robber. One type of grave torpedo was a shell, which would explode if the coffin was disturbed. Another variant was a mechanical device that would fire lead balls when triggered. All in all, this just goes to show how far people had to go just to get a little peace in the Victorian era. Next up on our list today we have James Blundell. The 19th century was a time when medicine is more art than science and doctors are as likely to prescribe leeches as they are a good old fashioned tonic. Enter James Blundell, a bona fide medical maverick pushing the boundaries of what's possible. This guy isn't just any doctor, he's a trailblazer in the world of blood transfusions, a practice that at the time was as groundbreaking as it was controversial. To refine his pioneering technique, Techniques, Blundell's work sometimes veered into the shadowy realm of post-mortem studies, and of course, by that I mean the illegal purchase of bodies from grave robbers. Despite the eerie backdrop, his research laid the groundwork for modern blood transfusions, transforming some medical emergencies from death sentences into survivable events. This is absolutely amazing. But at what cost? Of course, there were all the moral and ethical dilemmas with how he was going about these advancements. It was a classic case of the ends versus the means, with Blundell smack dab in the middle holding a blood bag in one hand and a moral compass in the other. And finally, to end off today, let's dive into a tale that's part riot, part medical drama, and all kinds of historical wildness, the body snatching riot. So picture New York City in 1788, which I do know is slightly pre-Victorian era, but I still believe this counts. At the time, New York is not the bustling metropolis we know today, but a growing town where everyone knows everyone else's business. Medical students at New York Hospital were keen on learning all there is about the human body, and textbooks Sure, but there's no substitute for the real deal, so they turned to body snatching. Now, imagine you're strolling past the hospital and through an open window, which is a crazy place to have somebody dissecting a body, but regardless, you see a medical student casually dissecting one, but it's not just any body, but possibly that of a recently departed loved one. You'd be absolutely livid, right? And that is exactly what happened. A boy spotted a dissected body, which rumors claimed was his own mother, though accounts vary, and it kicked off a spark of outrage that ignited the city's simmering tensions. The result? the doctor's riot. This wasn't just a small scuffle, it was an all-out melee involving thousands of New Yorkers, from common laborers to high and mighty officials, all descending on the hospital with a mix of grief, anger, and a thirst for justice. Or maybe just a bit of chaos. The rioters weren't just mad, they were furious, tearing through the hospital, clashing with doctors, and demanding accountability. The doctors, caught red-handed yet pioneering in their field, found themselves in a moral quagmire their pursuit of knowledge clashing with societal norms and ethics. So next time you think of a riot, think back in 1788. It was about something as primal and personal as how we treat our dead. A bizarre blip in the annals of American history, sure, but also a poignant reminder of the ever-evolving ethics in medicine and in public trust. All right, guys, that has been our list for today. Thanks so much for checking it out. I've been your host today, Olivia Kozolowski, and I'll see you again soon. Bye.